Today, we are talking about following the Holy Spirit. Following the Holy Spirit. You know, one thing I I get asked a lot is, Brant, how do I know what I'm supposed to do? How do I know what I'm supposed to do? When it comes to raising my kids, how do I know what that looks like? Uh, when it comes to my job, how do I know if I'm really, one, doing the right job, the job that God wants me to do, but two, that I'm doing my job for the glory of God? Uh, when it comes to my money, how do I know how to spend it? When it comes to my love life, how do I know who to date or who to pursue or e- any of these things? How do I know? Here's my answer. It requires the Holy Spirit. It requires the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, starting in verse 26, he says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. In fact, he also tells his disciples in John chapter 16, starting in verse 13, When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare to you, and all that the Father has is mine. Therefore I say that he will take what is mine and declare it to you so how do i know what i'm supposed to do when i'm supposed to do it well let me tell you it's nothing that you can do on your own at all it requires each and every one of us to follow the spirit that the holy spirit is not only your helper so he'll help you through all of these things but it says that he's the spirit of truth that he'll show you all truth. Everything that you need to know, God will show you exactly what you need to know when you need to know it. So all of this anxiety, all of this worry about, am I doing the right thing over here? Or would God be happy how I'm doing that? We go to him and we say, God, would you just show us? And we patiently wait. And guess what God will do? Go ahead, guess. I'll wait. He'll show it to you. He's not withholding anything from you. He's not trying to hide anything from you. He wants to show it to you. And he shows it to you through the Holy Spirit. Everything you need to know, God is going to reveal through the Holy Spirit. Let me take it one step further. The fruit of the Spirit that we receive. So if you've been around church any time, you've heard of this thing called the fruit of the Spirit. You know, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all the good stuff, right? All of it comes, get this, from a renewed mind. What do I mean by this? Let me connect these. Before you accepted Jesus, you were walking in one way. You made life all about what you wanted it to be. If you were being truly honest with yourself, that's what life was. Whatever you wanted, however you wanted it, whether it is seeking after affirmation, power, control, what have you. And so you pursued these things. However, when you accept Jesus, it should renew your mind. In fact, Jesus says you should repent and believe. Repent actually means that you change your mind about things. And from this renewed mind, it makes you think about the world differently. And it makes you think about how you live your life differently. So when you accept Jesus, what you should realize is I cannot do anything in my own strength. I have to do it in the strength of the Holy Spirit that God has given me. Guess what that will naturally do? It will have you seek God first. It will have you seek the Spirit first. That's the renewed mind. That's the the brand new mind. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. They set their things on the mind of earth. They think, what am I going to do with my money? What am I going to do with my job? What am I going to do with my free time? And that's what all of life is about. 
We set our mind what's in front of us here and now, and we do it in our own power. But, this is what he says, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Well, how can I do that? Well, I have to go to the Holy Spirit, and I have to say, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? And guess what happens when we start going to the Holy Spirit? That's when we start receiving and seeing in our own lives the fruit of the Spirit. You want to be more patient? You have to follow the Spirit. You want to be more gentle? You got to follow the Spirit. You want to be more kind? You want to be good? You want to, be, you want to have peace in your life, enjoy in your life, you want to feel love? It requires you to follow the Holy Spirit. How does God give us all these things? He reveals the truth to us. He gives you all the steps that you need to make that next step. In fact, that's why Proverbs tells us, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Well, what do I lean on? I lean on that God's going to tell me. God's going to reveal the truth to me. I'm going to lean on his understanding. So what does this mean? When we follow the Spirit, we can trust God will give us what we need, when we need it, Let me also say, whether we like it or not, God will give us what we need when we need it. So if we want to know what to do, if we want to experience God and we want to experience the fruit of the Spirit, we need to do what Paul says, and that is walk by the Spirit. So that's exactly what we're talking about doing today. We're talking about following the Holy Spirit. And I have three points today. I want to go ahead and tell them to you. One, following the Holy Spirit means living for God. And that means holistically. Everything you have is living for God. Uh, My second point, following the Spirit means accepting rejection. And then finally, following the Holy Spirit will get you where you need to be. Let's start in that first point. Following the Holy Spirit means living for God. For God, and we are going to start chapter 16, starting at verse 1, we'll go to verse 5. It says, And Paul also came to Derb and to Lystra. A disciple was there whose name was Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was Greek, and he was well spoken by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. And Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were there at those places. For they all knew his father was Greek. And as they went on their way through these cities, they delivered to them for observance, for decisions that have been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. So what's happened here? Paul, if you remember, has now split off from Barnabas. They had already decided to go to a lot of the places that they went in their first missionary journey. So Barnabas and John Mark, they go to Cyprus, that island. Paul decides to go ahead and go to some of the cities that they then visited after Cyprus. So a couple of those cities are Lystra and Derb and, of course, Iconium. And you could remember, if, if you've been here, that... Paul's ministry there was a really good ministry. If you remember in one of the places, they thought that he was Hermes and that Barnabas was Zeus, and they started to bring out the fatty calf and a whole bunch of problems. But while they were there, they did have some people come and accept Jesus. And so they're going there to not only share Jesus with the same people in the same cities, but to visit the churches and to encourage them to continue doing what they're doing. Now, while they were there, he met this young man named Timothy. And it tells us several things about Timothy. Uh, He was the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer and and a non-believing Greek father. He was also a really great guy. Like everybody spoke really well about him. And Paul sees Timothy and wants him to go with him to join him on his mission. Now, why is that? He's already got Silas with him. Why does he want to add someone else? This is a little bit separate from what I'm talking about the rest of the day, but I think this is very important for us as a church to hear. Those of us who are older must find younger people to raise up. Those of us who are older must find younger people and raise them up. I want you to notice Timothy doesn't say, Paul, can I go with you? No. Paul sees Timothy. Everybody speaks well about Timothy. He says, I want you to come with me. I want to disciple you. I want you to see what God has for you. I want to grow you up. Now let me ask, for those of us who are older, do we have that same heart when it comes to our younger members here? 
it, it tells us in, in uh, Titus, it says, Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be a reverent behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to, listen to this, teach what is good. That's not just teachers. This is talking about all women who are older. They are to teach what is good, and so to train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submission, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, older men urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching, this is everybody, in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may not put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Now, I've been in other churches before I've been here, Uh, For whatever reason, the Lord has allowed me to speak into other churches that they, they, they just ask me questions about what needs to happen next. And one of the things that I hear over and over and over is that we don't have young leaders. We don't have younger people who want to step up. In fact, a, a lot of the issue is we have a lot of older people who did a lot of stuff at once, um, but we have no one to take their place. And so the people who serve are just getting older and older and older, and they don't know what to do. Here's how you fix that. Older men and older women need to disciple younger people. If they don't, there's no one coming after you. Plain and simple. Now you might say, Brant, it takes a lot of time for me to disciple other people. Yes, it does. But there is no other way for people to come after you. What I've heard from many churches and what I've seen in some of the churches that I've served is that older people just think that the younger people just aren't stepping up. Part of the reason that they're not stepping up is they don't know how to. They don't know what to do. Those of us who are older bear the responsibility of going to younger people and saying, you come with me. That's your responsibility. We see Paul do it. We then see Paul talk about it in Titus. And so that's, that's kind of my separate discussion. If we want to see leaders grow up in this church, it means you have to go and bring people alongside you. Call, God is calling you to be good so that you may train and teach others to do the same. If you're like, Brant, you're speaking too broadly. Who, who are you maybe talking about? What can I do? We have a great group of college kids here. A great group of college kids. Uh, maybe some of you need to be like spiritual grandmas, that you just need to talk to them, take them out to lunch, figure out what candy they like, make a care package for them, write them a note, you know, take their picture on your phone and then print it out, hang it up on your refrigerator, promise to pray for them every day. Like that's huge stuff. Maybe you need to be like a father figure. Maybe you need to take them to lunch, be open to helping them with car issues. Maybe you need to just invite them, take them fishing, talk about your testimony. There are things that you can do to help the next generation fill your shoes and do greater. But you have to take those steps Paul realizes this. That's why he even has two letters directly to Timothy trying to help him grow up because he's always thinking about the next generation. We need to do the same. Okay. Next we see not only does Paul ask Timothy to come with him, Paul does something that if you've been staying with this seems very, very strange, and that is that Timothy, he wants him to be circumcised. If you guys remember, we've been having all these discussions about circumcision and how it does not save you. Okay, well, if it doesn't save you, then why is Paul asking Timothy to be circumcised? That doesn't make any sense. You would think what he would really want to do is have Timothy be the poster boy. See, Timothy's not circumcised. See, Timothy has the Holy Spirit. See, you don't got to do all these other things that these false teachers are doing. But he's not doing that. Instead, he says, Timothy, we're going to circumcise you. Paul addresses why he's doing this. 
when he's writing to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. What does that mean? He clarifies, to the Jews I became a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessing. So the whole reason he's circumcising Timothy is so that Timothy can win all. Now someone asked a really great question the other day and I want to clarify that really quickly. How do people know that other people are circumcised? In antiquity, there was a lot more public nudity. Uh, For example, or one example, if you needed to take a bath, you didn't have a nice bath in your house. You needed to go to a place that's known as a bathhouse. Guess what? There's other people there, and they're also bathing. They would see whether you're circumcised or not, okay? And so, and that's one instance of some other instances where people would would be able to tell. And once one person knows, kind of everybody knows. And so part of this is so that Timothy, when they see him out and about, like at the bathhouse, he could still be able to share the gospel with the Jews. He became all things to all people that he might win some. Now, let me ask. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to do what God says? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to do what God says? You know, when asked this question, I think many of us just go, yeah, yeah, of course, I don't, whatever God would tell me to do, I would drop everything and I'd do it. If he would just send like an angel or something, maybe he parts the clouds and, and, and maybe he just comes on the rainbow or whatever. And, and he tells me, you know, Brant, you need to go do this. Of course, I'd go do that. I'd drop everything. Here's the deal. God's done way, way, way more than that. And he tells you exactly what to do. And he's giving you the Holy Spirit to tell you exactly how to do it. I, I want you to understand this for a second. God has given you the Old Testament to point to your great need and what God wants you to do. God has given you the New Testament to point to what God has done and exactly what God wants you to do. In retrospect of what he's done, God came in flesh through Jesus, which angels proclaimed. You want angels from heaven? They came to talk about Jesus. And then Jesus Christ taught us all about the kingdom and exactly what we're supposed to do. And not only that, he dies for your sins. He then gives you the Holy Spirit telling you why he sent it. So that you'll be a witness. And for the Holy Spirit to lead you in every aspect of your life. God has done all of this and yet, Many of us still sit back and go, well, I'm just waiting for God to tell me what to do. God's told you. God's made it very clear about the steps that you need to take, how to be close to him. God has given you the Holy Spirit to guide you, to lead you. God does all this, yet many times we ignore what God has told us to do. If you want to live by the Spirit, if you want to receive all that God has for you, you must sacrifice and do what he has said. Jesus knows that you'll have to sacrifice. Just like Timothy has to be circumcised. That's not a fun thing. That's not something I'm sure he was looking forward to. He sacrificed. And Jesus says that you'll have to sacrifice. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Timothy was willing to do whatever it took to be all things to all people that he might win some. If you want to walk by the Spirit, you also have to leave everything on the table. You have to truly live for God. So I hope that you ask yourself this morning, 
What am I holding back from God? Am I generous in my giving? Am I willing to help people that need help? Am I willing to do what Jesus has told us to do and to be a witness? Am I willing to change my job, to change my schedule, to have my kids do a few less activities to make sure that we are fully living for God? If you want to walk by the Spirit, you must first live for God. And that does not always mean health, wealth, and prosperity, mind you. But sometimes, actually, following the Spirit means you'll be rejected in what you think you might want to do. Here's my second point. Following the Spirit means accepting rejection. Let's start in verse 6. We'll read through verse 10. It says, And they went through the region of uh, Figuria and uh, Galatia. Okay, now I, I text those who receive our church text. If you don't, uh, you can scan that QR code and it'll, it'll put you as part of our text. But I sent a lot of you uh, some maps this morning. So I just want to refer to some of these maps, okay? So they're going through this region. It's not a city, it's a region. Figuria and Galatia. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So more than likely what he's wanting to do is to go into Ephesus. So they're going west. He wants to go directly west. The Holy Spirit says, no, you can't go there. So then they have to go north. So then he decides that uh, when he come up to Mysia, they attempted to go in Bithynia. Again, this is another region. So they're wanting to go north and continue going north. But look at this. It says, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. So their path looks something like this. They're down in here. They're wanting to go west. Holy Spirit doesn't allow them to. So then they go north, and they start kind of going west a little bit, but they want to go straight north to this other region. Holy Spirit doesn't let them do that. And so now they've walked a long, long way into uh, this place called Troas. And that's where we find them. Okay, I hope that gives you guys some kind of visual in, in what I'm talking about. So in the vision, this is verse 9, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and a man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now let me tell you, if you're looking at the map, you might go, or one map that showed the places that I'm talking about, you go, where's Macedonia? It's nowhere close. Well, where Macedonia is is in a whole separate map that I sent to you where you have to sail across this thing. You have to stop at this island and then continue to sail um, pretty much northwest. So a Macedonia guy says, hey, you should come over to Macedonia and help us. This is, of course, in a vision. In verse 10, when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So what exactly is going on? He's wanting to go to Asia Minor. He's wanting to go to Ephesus. Again, Asia Minor is not what we think of as Asia. We're not talking about China or Japan. We're talking about uh, modern-day Turkey. He's wanting to go into modern-day Turkey, into probably Ephesus, and, and the Holy Spirit rejects him. So he says, okay, well, then I'll just go to this other place that I know to be influential. Again, God rejects them. So they finally go to Troas. So here's Paul. He wants to spread the good news of Jesus. He has an idea on where he wants to go and on how he wants to do it. However, again and again and again, the Holy Spirit continues to deny him. Let me ask, have you ever experienced that? where you want to live for God, you're doing your best to honor God, and you do what you think he would want you to do, but then you just run into wall after wall after wall. Like you want to serve the Lord more, but then your spouse doesn't understand why you're wanting to be at church so much. Tough. You want to serve God, but now you're going through a breakup for my college kids and my high school students. That you had told the Lord that you want to do more for him, but you're stuck in the most difficult semester of classes that you've ever been in. That you finally are given the boldness to share with that one coworker, but then they completely change departments. 
You told the Lord you really want to devote yourself to him, but now your health is taking a turn for the worse. There's a lot of things in life where we have plans, where the Lord finally puts it on our heart, like, this is what I want to do, Lord. And then for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit comes and just makes it impossible. Impossible. Over and over again, there will be times in our life where we want to do something for God, but he has other plans. I want you to hear this, church. This is good, okay? Moreover, while God's plans for you in this season might have been your last choice, they were God's first choice. Did you know that? The season that you're going through right now, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter the heartache issues, while this might be your last choice, God has you exactly where you need to be. God will do with you right where he has planned you for you to be. What he has for you right now is greater than what you have planned for yourself. Let me say that again a little bit clearer. What God has planned for you in this season is greater than what you have planned for yourself. Paul had great plans. Paul wanted to go into Asia Minor. He wanted to reach Ephesus. I mean, there's a book of the Bible called Ephesus. You know, somehow, some way he got there, right? He had big plans, but God had other plans. In fact, God was going to fulfill what he put on Paul's heart, but just in a different way. And we see this a lot with the, with the early Christians. They waited for the Holy Spirit to come. The Holy Spirit led them to speak the word of God with boldness despite persecution. The Holy Spirit gave Stephen a glimpse of heaven before getting martyred. The Holy Spirit leads Philip away from where there was a lot of good ministry happening to speak with the Ethiopian eunuch. The Holy Spirit leads Peter to go with the Gentiles with no distinction. The Holy Spirit told Paul and Barnabas to go on mission. The Holy Spirit is told again and again and again throughout the book of Acts exactly where they need to go. And let me tell you, it's not always their first choice. For many of them, it's the last place they wanted to go. And yet, that is where God is moving and where God does a lot of good. At every turn, Christians are not living by their own might, their own plans, or their own way. They are totally reliant on the Holy Spirit. So what's going on? Paul has a vision from a man in Macedonia that says, come over to Macedonia and help us. If you look on your map, this is really cool. God actually leads him to Troas where he can easily get on a ship and go to Macedonia. While we would look at that, and we would go, where does Paul want to go? He probably wants to go, let's say, Ephesus, Thyatira, one of those places in, the, in Asia Minor. You would look at that, and you'd go, guys, doing a lot of walking for nothing. He's wasting a lot of energy and a lot of time, and he's not accomplishing anything that he thinks needs to be accomplished. Have you ever felt like that in your life? Where you just feel like you're walking in circles and circles and circles and you're going, God, when am I ever going to like move forward? When are you ever going to show up and we really get the breakthrough we want? It just feels like I'm walking around where God wants me to be. But get this, when he has the vision, he's exactly where he needs to be to get on a boat to go to Macedonia and we're about to see what God has for Paul once he gets to a place nowhere near he thought he wanted to go. God often uses rejection to get you exactly where you need to be. And I want you to see how God uses all of this. This is my third point. Following the Spirit will get you where you need to be. Let's read verse 11. So setting sail from Troas, he made a direct voyage to Samothrace. That's, that's the little island. And then the following day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we were supposed to be there a, was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. That's in Asia Minor. A seller of purple goods, so she had influence and money who was a worshiper of God, 
The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, her household as well, she urged us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. The whole time, Paul is wanting to figure out, how do I reach Asia Minor? How do I get to these cities like Ephesus? How do I get to these cities like Thyatira? God takes him way away from where you would normally go if you want to reach those cities. Makes him walk around all of Asia Minor. Makes him sail across into Macedonia. And yet, what is Paul able to do once he's in Macedonia? Preaches the gospel. A lady named Lydia and her whole household accepts the Lord. And now Lydia is able to go back and reach the very place that God had put on Paul's heart to begin with. If you've been walking with the Lord for any significant amount of time, I believe that many of us, if not all of us, have some story where it feels like that, right? We want to do something great for the Lord. We want to see the Lord do something, and the Lord really puts something on our heart. But then it just feels like rejection after rejection is going to make it impossible. And yet, when you look at the long journey that it took to get there, you figured out that that was the best road for you. It's never what you would have accepted. It's never what you would have dreamed up. But it's exactly what you needed in the time that you needed it. This is exactly what's happened to Paul. Paul's trying to reach Asia Minor, but God sends him to Macedonia to get the job done. You know, in our lives, we can become so worried about where we are in life, can't we? We're so worried about our status. We're so worried about how much money that we've saved up till now. We're so worried about so many things. But have you ever considered that you're exactly where you need to be? Maybe you're like Lydia, that you're exactly where you need to be. You're from somewhere else, but God has sent you far away from where you're from. But it's there that you hear the goodness of the Lord. You know, maybe the Lord has... Put some struggles in your life so that you would join this family at New Heights Baptist Church. Maybe, maybe the Lord has put these difficulties in your life so that you would rededicate your life to Jesus, to refocus your life on what life is really all about. Maybe God has done all these things to get you to open your ears, to open your mind. And to hear what he's trying to tell you. Or maybe you're like Paul. Maybe the Lord has put something in your heart and you really want to see it done. But it just feels like the way you are going to get it done just isn't working. But maybe the Lord has put you right where you are in this situation, in this city, in this seat today. To accomplish what you would have never accomplished in the first place. When we follow the Spirit, God will put you exactly where you need to be. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to stress about it. We could just be thankful that the Lord is guiding your steps when we listen to the Holy Spirit. So no matter where you are in life, I believe that God is preparing you exactly for where you need to be and to do exactly what He wants you to do. No more worrying. We could be confident when we follow the Spirit, God will work it all out so here's my main point today you need to follow the spirit you need to follow the spirit i find that many of us don't want to walk in the spirit it's hard because there's a lot of things that we want to do and maybe if you're like me you think that your ways are always right that your ideas are probably the best what we would rather do is tell god our plans and say god would you just bless what we're going to do Many of us have become disappointed about our Christian walks when we live like this because the truth is we're making plans that God never intended. When we follow our own paths, life might be comfortable, life might be easy, but there's a major lack of blessings when we live by our own strength and our own plans. My plea today for you is just to walk by the Spirit. And this requires everything, your whole life, all of it, To be put on the table and say, God, show me what you want me to do. If you want breakthrough, if you want to experience all the incredible things God has for you, if you want to be exactly 
where God wants you to be. Stop following your own plans and agenda and start following the Spirit. So here's my challenge for you today. I just want you to pray. God, what do you want me to do? Not what, not what you want to do. Don't ask God, bless these plans. I want you to just pray, God, what are your plans for me? Show me your plans for me. I don't have to see the whole thing just for today. Show me your plans for me. And I believe that's where you will see the greatest breakthrough in your Christian walk. You know, Jesus did everything to get us back connected with God. Jesus, who created the world, saw us in our sin and our shame and our separation for God, and he says, I want to rescue those people. And he came fully God, fully man, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, all that he would die on the cross, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And he rose three days later, that if you do put your faith in Jesus, if you do allow that renewal of your mind, repent and believe in him. You don't have to guess about what life is about. You don't have to find your own purpose. You don't have to worry about all these things that you formerly worried about. All we have to do is follow the Spirit and let God take care of the rest. It's hard. It's hard letting go. It's hard saying, God, you could have it all. But that's where all of our blessings lie is when we say, God, I come to you with what I have. Do with it whatever you want. Let's pray.